nicotine increase the risk of diabetes? In today's episode, I'm sharing some of my own data from my lab's publication in Nature earlier this week on how nicotine acts on the brain and the pancreas to increase blood glucose levels. Only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on nutrition, health, and medicine. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 33, where every week I arm you with some scientific evidence so that we can lead the healthy lives that we want to live. Today, I happen to be at the Society for Neuroscience Conference here in Chicago. I am learning of so many new studies in neuroscience, ranging from how to diagnose and how to treat different conditions of the brain, including stroke, Alzheimer's, addiction, mental illness, and more. When I come back next week, I cannot wait to share some of the interesting studies I have seen here. But what are we covering today? Well, this week is a very, very special episode because I am sharing with you my lab study that was published this past Thursday in one of the top journals in the world, Nature. I am lucky enough to be a co-first author on this paper, along with Alex Duncan, Masago Ishikawa, and Molly Heyer. This study is on the front cover page of the Nature magazine, which is just so unbelievable and cool. The title of the cover of the story on the magazine is Smoke Signals, Neuronal Feedback Loop Links Nicotine Addiction to Increased Risk of Diabetes. And I'll make sure to post the front cover of the magazine on my social media so that you can all see it. So in today's episode, I'm going to be walking you through our study's findings. So as we always do, let's start off with some core takeaways. We have known for several years that there is an association between tobacco smoking and the risk for type 2 diabetes. But the reason why there is a link between the two has never been realized until our study. What we have found in our lab is that our genetics and the function of particular brain regions can change our response to nicotine, meaning it can change if we think nicotine is aversive, you know, noxious, or if it feels rewarding and good. Likewise, our genetics and the function of particular brain regions can change if nicotine increases our risk for diabetes or not. But if that's the case, then how does nicotine increase the risk for type 2 diabetes? Well, even though nicotine may feel rewarding and pleasurable, underneath all of that, nicotine can still send a stress signal to our brain, which sends a signal to our pancreas. This signal results in our blood glucose levels to rise. The reason for this is so that we have energy to fight or flight, which is our body's typical response to stress. But when nicotine repeatedly acts on this brain circuit, it may lead to chronically elevated blood glucose levels. These data have many implications, particularly in light of the latest reports that have concluded 40% of high school seniors are using nicotine-containing e-cigarettes. Now, let's get into the details. Even back in the 1930s, it was known that tobacco could lead to increased blood glucose levels. Haygard and Greenberg in 1934 reported that they thought tobacco acted on the adrenal glands to induce induce a sort of stress response that could cause the body to increase its blood glucose levels. But more recently, Willie in 2007 in JAMA pooled together 25 cohort studies that together included 1.2 million people to see if there was a link between smoking tobacco and new cases of type 2 diabetes. 
the odds of developing type 2 diabetes were 44% higher in those who smoke cigarettes versus those who never have. Now, if someone happened to be a heavy cigarette smoker, which was defined as 20 cigarettes or more per day, then there was a 61% higher chance of type 2 diabetes incidence. However, if someone quit smoking, then that increased risk dropped down to nearly 20% compared to never smokers. So that is great news and some motivation to quit nicotine, that your risk for type 2 diabetes will decline if you quit smoking. So perhaps if you are living with type 2 diabetes and currently using a nicotine product, one way that may help improve your blood sugar levels could be to quit smoking. However, at the same time, we know that because nicotine suppresses appetite, when people quit smoking, they tend to have an increase in appetite and gain weight. So please do keep this in mind that if you gain weight, if you quit smoking and enter into the overweight or obese category, that this may also have a negative effect on your health. So it's all about balance in that scenario. I've mentioned before in past episodes that drugs such as nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, and even sugar, that they can hijack our brain's learning centers, such as the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmentum. And when the drugs act on these brain regions, they make us think that we need these drugs. And this is what perpetuates dependence and addiction because it feels good. It gives us a pleasurable response. Now, nicotine acts on many brain regions and activates the receptors in the brain called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, when these receptors are activated by nicotine, it causes a release of acetylcholine, which, depending on the brain region, can result in different feelings, such as a rewarding, pleasurable feeling if it activates the ventral tegmentum and the nucleus accumbens, But higher doses of nicotine can also activate aversive brain regions that make us feel, you know, nauseous or unwell. Those brain regions include the medial habendula and the interpeduncular nucleus. So, you know, if you've ever smoked a cigarette or a cigar and taken in maybe more than usual or really high amount and you felt kind of nauseous or not very well, it's probably because that high dose nicotine has now activated these aversive brain centers. Now, these two aversive brain regions have been coined, you know, the noxious aversive centers because they're linked to the negative feelings associated with high-dose nicotine. And again, that's the medial habenula and the interpeduncular nucleus. Interestingly, some people are more sensitive, um, but people can also be less sensitive to those noxious feelings of nicotine. And that could be due to someone's genetics. There are genetic-wide association studies that show some genes such as CHRNA5, which is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit, is linked to nicotine dependence or nicotine addiction. The reason being is that this particular gene or protein functions as sort of an aversive negative signal in the brain telling us we have had too much nicotine. But if someone is born with what we call a loss of function allele for this gene, it means that this gene or protein is not functioning properly anymore for these people. And that means that they are resistant to the negative noxious effects of nicotine and thus more likely to be a heavy cigarette smoker if they smoke cigarettes. Now this was published very well by Fowler in 2010 in the journal Nature. Interestingly, here in this study that I'm talking about today that was published last week in Nature, we show that there's another gene, TCF7L2, that is very highly expressed in these particular aversive brain regions and can regulate the response to nicotine and as a result regulates how much nicotine is taken. Because if nicotine feels aversive, someone's not going to take in very much nicotine. But if it's only rewarding for them and not aversive, they're likely to take in more and more likely to be a heavy smoker. I think a particularly interesting finding in this study is that in some viral tracing experiments, we observed that the medial habenula, this brain center that regulates the noxious effects of nicotine, was directly connected to the pancreas. This is the first time that this has been reported. So we know that nicotine acts directly on the neurons of the medial habenula, and this can lead to the habenula sending signals to the pancreas to increase blood glucose levels. 
But also importantly, there is a gene or protein, like I said, that's called TCF7L2, that regulates the function of this circuit. Now, TCF7L2 is very densely expressed in this brain region, the medial habenula. So if individuals are living with alleles, which means slight differences in their code for the gene TCF7L2, then it could mean that this protein does not work normally for them. This could result in the medial habenula from functioning differently and could either increase or decrease the function of its connection to the pancreas and potentially can even change the risk for diabetes for these individuals then. The reason why we know this is because I had used CRISPR gene editing, which I spoke about several episodes back. And using CRISPR gene editing, I deleted the protein TCF7L2 from the medial habenula. And afterward, we saw an increased intake of nicotine at high doses. So that aversive, noxious signal to high-dose nicotine was likely no longer there. If nicotine is only rewarding and not noxious or aversive, then more nicotine will be taken. Again, this has been observed in humans in genetic-wide association studies where certain genes regulating the noxious effects of nicotine do not function normally. Now, the reason why activation of the medial habenula causes such increases in blood glucose is unclear, but recent findings suggest that the medial habenula plays a key role in coordinating adaptive behavioral responses to stressful or threatening stimuli. So it is likely that the medial habenula also regulates high blood glucose responses to stress, the function of which is to increase energy for flight, fight or flight behaviors. Now, by repeatedly hijacking this medial habenula regulated stress response by taking in nicotine, it further worsens abnormalities in blood glucose levels and glucose regulating hormones such as insulin and glucagon, which could increase the risk for diabetes. So to break it down simply, nicotine sends a stress signal to the pancreas via the medial habenula and TCF7L2 protein in order to increase blood glucose levels to give us energy for a fight or flight response. But over time, this may increase the risk for diabetes. So this research has a lot of potential implications. In light of all the recent reports on e-cigarette use, particularly among teenagers, it is important to highlight that nicotine in itself may carry some risk. Clinically, nicotine is linked to higher blood glucose levels and a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. And now here we have determined the mechanism by how that may happen. But it is important to note that not just smokers are exposed to nicotine, but secondhand smoke could also be associated here. For example, a coli in the journal Addictive Behaviors in 2007 concluded that Many studies report that secondhand smoke can cause bystanders to have significant levels of nicotine in their blood, and sometimes the amount of nicotine in their blood could be equivalent to that of someone who currently smokes cigarettes. E-cigarettes can also cause bystanders to be exposed to nicotine. Kogala in 2014 in the journal Nicotine and Tobacco Research reported that e-cigarette vapor can contain 0.82 to 6.23 micrograms per cubic meter of nicotine and can cause people nearby to be exposed. However, they did note that the amount of nicotine in secondhand smoke from tobacco cigarettes was much higher than that of e-cigarettes. But of course, that depends on the level of nicotine in the e-cigarette pod and the amount of use as well. So in summary, in our study, we show that nicotine acts on a particular brain region called the medial habenula. And when nicotine activates this brain region, it may induce a stress signal in our brain, and the habenula will send a signal down to the pancreas to increase blood glucose levels in order to provide energy to fight or flight in this stressful response. So if someone smokes chronically over a long period of time, then this stress circuit between the habenula and the pancreas may be constantly activated. And this could potentially lead to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, which is what we do see in observational studies in humans. So it's important to keep in mind that even though taking in nicotine may feel good and rewarding and pleasurable, that underneath that, it could still be sending stress signals in the brain. 
Now, this data has a lot of implications, specifically in light of the large increase in use of e-cigarettes containing nicotine by teenagers. This is also important information for those living with type 2 diabetes that are current smokers or for past smokers. So that is it for today, my People Scientist Army. I hope you enjoyed me sharing some of our lab's research with all of you, and that's something I hope to be able to do again in the future when our publications are coming out. I hope that you all have a super healthy week, and make sure to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, because that is where I post the papers that I talk about each week. I also like to share some extra tidbits of information for the week's episode there as well. Now, if you like the podcast, then please tell a friend about it so that they can be a part of the People Scientist Army as well. So I will meet you back here the same time and the same place next week on the People Scientist Podcast. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.